I just want to talk to you about what your life and and the things that you really know that would be so valuable to anybody listening and also helps us tell about the history of Comanche a little bit. You think you might know anything about Comanche, Texas? Neil, I probably know a few things. Uh, in just a little over one month from now, I'll be 92 years old, and I've got a fairly good memory of younger days through a history. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's the stuff I'll, we'll talk about. Maybe I'll put a little color to it for anybody that's listening. Is um, This man was my elementary principal. And I think I got sent to his office maybe two times, you know, a couple of times, I don't know, just doing stuff kids do. And that'll be a part of this conversation I'm interested in hearing about is how you got into school administration, church, all these things. But really, if you're going to talk about history, it's cool to start at the beginning. So you mentioned you're about 92, going to be 92 pretty quick, pretty quick. Where were you born? What was your parents like? What were you, do you have any siblings? Tell us about just where does James Wilson come from? Yeah. Neil, uh, my folks are native of Comanche County, both born in Comanche County, uh, mainly northeast of Comanche, more near the Van Dyke community. And, uh, uh, they were sharecroppers in the early days, the 20s and the 30s. And, uh, of course, we know about the Depression years of 1930s. Economic times were very difficult money-wise. And my family, mother and dad, were just sharecroppers in the northeast of Comanche. So I, I started out on just a sharecropper's farm. And if it doesn't rain, you don't get much money in sharecropping business. And... So uh, I can remember actually as a young boy, like 11 or 12, playing with two mules a little bit. My dad would let me do the simple work. We called it cultivating. And you have two mules and ride down to cut the weeds out between the rows of crops. And What crops were they? Uh, mainly, uh, they were peanuts then. Yeah. They, they had come into Comanche County, and uh, I recall, too, that we had two mules, and my dad always said we had a good left-handed mule. You go down four rows, and the two mules have to turn left each time. You come back, you skip over four rows. and Oh, you always keep them turning left. Keep them turning left. And if you don't hit the row head on, you'd ply up a few pieces of a peanut plant, and he'd get on me about that. You're losing us money. Yeah. And, and so I can remember some of the— uh, the poor days and the, and the mule days before many people had tractors. In fact, very none, none of that I knew had a tractor. Yeah. And then uh, we eventually moved into town. Uh, economic times were very difficult in the 1930s, and there was a government project came along, federal government project called the WPA, Works Progress Administration. And uh, uh, my dad got on a job in the Comanche city of Comanche, and the crew was helping put down the city sewer lines and water lines. They didn't have any mechanical tractor diggers. They dug the ditches, many of the ditches in Comanche, city of Comanche, by hand, grubbing hoe and shovel. So he got to make a dollar a day. He'd tell me about that later in life, and I'd I would think, no, you got this mixed up. It must have been a dollar an hour. And in, uh, in recent years, we looked it up on the computer uh, information you can look up. And actually, the pay in the 1930s for a day's work was a dollar and three cents a, a day, not an hour, a dollar a day. So we lived in, in uh, difficult times. And in digging one of the streets one time, sewer line, uh, there was a house for sale in the city of Comanche over near the old grammar school and elementary on North Pearl Street. And there was a for sale sign there, and my dad thought, well, that's a good-looking old house. And it's still there today, by the way, vacant. 
But uh, he bought it for eight hundred dollars, and I recall our we moved into town then when I was about ten, eleven years old, and and the monthly payment was eight dollars a month. And I can recall my parents saying many times, "Where are we going to get eight dollars to make this monthly house payment?" And, yeah. But they made it. We made it. So I grew up from oh about age twelve. Uh, a city boy in Comanche. <laughs> yeah, you bet. <laughs> you just one of them city folk yeah. living in town. Yeah. Always wore overalls. Had a buck on the front here and barefooted in warm weather. Uh, I have a second grade school picture of our entire class and all eight or ten boys sitting down on the front row were barefooted and they didn't have any shoes. Uh, probably... You always bought shoes for two years. First year, you they were too large, and then you grow into them by the second year yeah. to fit your feet. Right. Times are difficult back in my childhood days, I recall that. Yeah, but you still have a smile on your face about it. So how are you able to do that? Well, I, I think it's just that every, I'll say nearly everybody was in the same boat. You weren't by yourself, and we all recognize that Times were hard, and we just grew up that way. And I, all my old childhood buddies are dead and gone now. I regret that, but right. uh, got to know a lot of them for many years. And then I, <clears throat> I did start school in the, the old Westward Building, which is one block west of the First Baptist Church. And uh, I recall the, the days there. There's an old oak tree still up there on the west end of that playground that we played under. They had blow sand under it, and you could dig in the sand and play there. And uh, We didn't have any lunch rooms. We didn't have any lunch rooms in the Comanche school system until I got into Comanche High School in 1946, I think. Yeah. And in the early days, you brought your lunch if you had one, uh, every child didn't eat three meals a day. We'd have a breakfast and a supper, but you just skip. If you didn't bring a sack lunch to school, you just ate two meals a day. And I can recall those days. And But you didn't think about it because other people were in the same boat you were in. Right. And uh, it wasn't unique at the time. It was just hard days, financially speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, there's... That does sound really hard to a oh, yes. guy it was, who, yeah. you know, I've just lived in prosperous times. It's oh, been yeah. it's pretty good my whole life. I've never experienced that kind of pressure, you know, and, and money was hard to find. Work was hard to find. Food was hard to find. All those things. I recall that the Comanche school system didn't have us and in school lunchroom until 1946 at Comanche High School. First year even the high school had a lunchroom. Yeah. We need to look up and see what that school lunch cost. Maybe a I wouldn't or have any idea. <laughs> you know. I, I never ate in it. I still either brought a lunch or skipped a meal. Tell me about your mom a little bit. So was she just at home keeping? <laughs> uh, oh, and I want to hear about siblings. Did you have any Well, my mom sister? and dad were, as many people, young people back then, were uneducated. They had to work somehow to try to make a living. Uh, my dad, uh, I can recall only once or twice talking, and he just said, well, I think I went to the first grade. And my mama said she thought he made it to the third grade at Van Dyke. Yeah. And she made it to the fifth grade. Comanche had an elementary school out on the east side of town. I don't recall the name of that, but she made it to the fifth grade. So certainly they weren't educated, but they, they were workers. We knew how to work. Yeah, that's right. And there's a lot of forms of education. You know, there's, oh, there's yes. school yes. education, then there's life education that's it you bet yep i like to ask everybody this question i think i'm really curious to just hear your answer who did you look up to like did kids of that era did you have a hero did did you have somebody in your life that you're like man i want to be like them I, I i think it'd have to just be my teachers it seemed like that um uh, I never had a teacher that wasn't uh, 
aware of the background of some of the students, the hardships the students went through. And of course, the teachers weren't, they weren't rich people either, yeah. just getting by. But they always seemed to have a, a, a knowledge of the children that were suffering some hardships at home and things. So I, I think I admired all of my teachers, really. Uh, my first grade teacher, Miss Agnes Graham, we called her Miss Agnes by her first name, but she uh, had been a, a missionary in Korea. And recently in the Comanche newspaper, the local Methodist church uh, uh, benefited from her Christian work in Korea back in the 1920s. And Miss Agnes is my first grade teacher that I remember of all my teachers, I remember her much, but we'd have little reading circles, six or eight sitting on the bench and read out of the little book. And if you didn't pay attention, she'd lay you over her lap and pat your handy two or three times with her hand. And uh, <laughs> we, we thought that was just part of school. You know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Times have just changed so much, you know. I mean, it seems like to me there's a lot of good stuff that we've kind of forgot about and maybe or don't use in a reasonable way. All right, so you've gone, now you've kind of gone to high school. What did you do in high school? Did, did a, a certain subject really seem interesting to you? Did you play sports? I, I wasn't an, a, what you call an honor roll student, <laughs> maybe once or twice in my life, but uh, uh, I wasn't good at math. Uh, Miss Hattie Brightman was a math teacher, a great lady, and uh, uh I remember her as a math teacher. She taught all the Comanche high math. And Miss Yule Warner was the English teacher. It's just a funny thing. Even today, at my age, Miss Warner, the English teacher, knew that some old boys like me never would speak good English because we didn't diagram sentences very good and prerogatives hanging down below an adjective or whatever. And yeah. she'd say about every week or two, she'd say, now, if you don't learn but two things in, in English where you can speak decent, don't use a dangling preposition and don't use a double pronoun. And of course, the dangling preposition is at, like, where are you at? Where are you been at? Don't use at. Yeah. And then she'd talk about the double pronoun, like, Neil, you ought to do this. Neil, don't do that. You don't use the name and then you the pronoun with it. So she'd always bring that up. And all my years, I can remember her saying, it'd help you be a decent English speaker if you'd avoid those two things. Yeah, <laughs> that yeehaw, for the cowboy perspective, faithful, they listen. And I'll, I'll say yeehaw to stuff that makes lots of good sense. And that one seems to be one that deserves it. No dangling <laughs> prepositions and no <laughs> double pronouns. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you didn't have a subject that you liked really good? Well, I, I guess history was my favorite subject. I did. I, I was good at history. I could remember dates. And yeah. and uh, the progress of civilization always amazed me how it came from this stage of life or or another stage of life. And and I, I liked history and, and used to be good at remembering dates on things, uh, historical dates, stuff like that. Yeah. Too. Um, you think that was just natural having a good memory? Or well, it had something? to be because I guess it just happened to be. Now I wasn't good at math, so I guess I just happened to be yeah. good with the number dates. Did you do you remember a teacher? I think her first name's Patty. I can't come up with her last name, but I've heard of her spoke of pretty often. She wouldn't have been teaching you though. She you might have been working around the same years as her. Granny Grace, my grandmother Grace, Eltis and Grace, my grandparents. Yes. She talked about. I just remember, I'll think of it here in a little bit. We we'll, we can kind of keep talking when I come up with her name. I'll bet money you remember and have a some a story we might tell on her. Okay, so what about sports? Did you do sports? Yes, did they have uh, sports. <clears throat> yes, I did. Uh, Comanche High School really didn't have many sports. It was just football and basketball and a little bit of track, and that's about it. But uh, I, I was blessed with a little bit of athletic ability. I made all district, all regional, really, in football. We just went to regional. You didn't have a state championship. And then 
our senior year, Bill of Bean came. I bought some land. I'm an ex-major league baseball player. And basically all by himself, he, he had a, a baseball program for Comanche High. Yeah. And uh, I I was pretty good at that as a catcher. And Bill, Bill always uh, umpired games. So between dead moments of the game, well, I'd talk to Bill. And he's an ex-major leaguer, played some. Well, that impressed me. And uh, yeah. so I was good enough. And uh, – I, I went to a Brooklyn Dodger tryout camp, Fort Worth Cats, and was going to uh, get a little minor league baseball contract to play in the Brooklyn Dodger system. And I got to go to Fort Worth Cats, and some of the old major league uh, cats went on to be in the Brooklyn Dodgers. But anyway, uh, the, the Korean War came along in June 1950, and and uh, uh, the Dodgers are going to pay me $125 a month to play in a minor league team, but uh, I, I was dra primary draft aides then, and yeah. so I didn't get to do any of that, and I, I wasn't get that good. I didn't have good eyesight. Didn't even really knew that I needed eyeglasses. And they played under the old dim lights at nighttime then, so that ended that. And uh, but I always give credit to Bell Bean for any baseball program that uh, Comanche High had in the late 1940s. Well, yeah, anybody listening that is in Comanche and has a kid that plays in the CYC now, yeah, there's a picture of Bell of Bean, or at least a plaque is that right? commemorating him out at the, the youth council is ball it? field. I'm glad to hear that. I yeah. didn't know it. Yeah, there, You bet there is. And he's, uh, he's pretty integral in Comanche's history around sports and baseball specifically. So was lucky to have him come to town and and be a part of building things it is kind of interesting how people play that that part of building things in this community yes you know to me you played a huge role in building our school system I just as an administrator for how many years did you do that do you remember i was at comanche 18 years well, actually, 19 years. Uh, yeah. I came back to Comanche as a junior high coach. Uh, Wait, time yeah. out. I skipped some part of the yeah. story, though. Yeah. So did you go to war? Well, not really war. I was in the Army during the uh, Korean War. But a blessing there, uh, I mentioned earlier that I didn't have much education or college or even interest in it. But in the Army, my, it turned out my very two best buddies were college graduates. And in the Korean War, they only drafted single boys. No, if you got married, you didn't get drafted. Yeah. But I was in the army with two college graduates, which was a blessing. I didn't know it then, but I found out. Well, they put their britches on just like I do. Well, maybe I could go to college. So after I got out of the army, I owned the GI Bill. I went to school as an older veteran in college. I was older than the, most of the kids in college, but I went through North Texas on the GI Bill, and then uh, one of my old Army buddies, one of the two I mentioned that was good in sports, he'd graduated from TCU and had played basketball and football at TCU. And so when I got out of college, he was up in the Panhandle, Demet, Texas, as a coach, and we'd communicated, so he hired me as an assistant up in the Panhandle, and... and uh, was it just pure luck, you know? And yeah, the, an interesting right. thing, a very interesting story on the integration, block integration of students. Along about 1960, we had a young black boy at Demet. Uh, his grandparents had got him out of the slums of uh, Dallas and brought him to up in the Panhandle of Texas. Well, the Texas school system started integrating somewhere about right now, 1960. But he turned about out to be a good super athlete, and uh, the uh, basketball, Demet basketball, made it to the state finals. The old Gregory Jim down at Austin, and uh, Daryl Royal, at the coach at Texas, had heard about this good block running back up in the Panhandle, and he got to see him play basketball at Austin, but. Daryl, he looked at Finn. Daryl said, he's good enough, but I don't think we're ready to integrate at Texas. Yeah. And they didn't. And then Barry Bryant called, and he didn't even know he's black. So he, Barry didn't want him for sure as far as he's black. And then the uh, University of Washington 
recruited junior, Carl Fields, a black boy from Demet, and uh, uh, partly to get him, they got they gave uh, the, our young black athlete a, a good job at Bowen Aircraft, to be janitors, it helped to recruit him out there, and yeah, and he went on and got to play three years in the pros with Green Bay. So I was in in the early days of black integration of players and. It all worked out good, I thought. I was proud to see any black player come along. Yeah, you know, I think you're touching on a thing I'm super curious about. Uh, all of that seems kind of just like a tough time. It was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Golly, yeah. so tough. Tough for everybody. Yeah. Um, I heard Morgan Freeman put it pretty good one time. He said, why don't we just quit talking about black, white, and all this stuff? Why don't you call me Morgan, and I'll call you James, yeah. and we'll be a couple of humans. And I thought that was pretty good. Although, it doesn't erase the truth that that time was turbulent, that time was tough, there there had been things that are just mean things done on both sides. Well, and then I, I, when I came uh to, to Comanche, I'd heard about a vacancy down here, and and uh, my wife Elaine, my dear wife Elaine, has been passed on for seven years now, and I miss her. But uh, we found out about some farmland near Gustine, a two hundred and twenty acres, and I, with the GI Bill, bought a fa some farm land and got to be uh, in the Comanche school system, plus a farm on the side and raise some cattle and stuff like that. Awesome. And, now, time out. We got to go back to Miss Wilson. That's how yeah. I knew her. She was a teacher. Okay, yes. Uh, how'd you, how'd y'all get together? Well, Tell we me met that. at Demet. That was my first job after the Army or after college. And she had just graduated from uh, West Texas State at Canyon, Texas. And she was a second grade teacher and I was there and we met and Somehow it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the first time you saw her, the first time you asked her on a date? Oh, yeah, I, I remember. She was among a group, and uh, she was the prettiest girl there. <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome. And I wish, well, most people that are listening to this are going to remember her and know her. I mean, she was a super, super, like, just shining person like i don't think you could be around her and not be happy she was just like that okay so so now y'all have courted got married and you find about the farmland in comanche did you always kind of think about coming back here since this is where your roots were or did it just kind no, of no it really uh i don't i don't recall really how we got here uh I, I must have been, a, we were just down here one time, and I'd heard about this place for sale down here near Gustine Farmland, and I knew that I had the GI Bill availability to get some uh, a grant money to buy land, and I guess that's it. Just by accident, we found out about the land and wound up applying here at Comanche. Yeah. And, yeah. So was the, you said grant, so they would, as... Uh, armed service member or veteran, you could, was it, did you have to pay it back? Or uh, yes, yes, you had to pay it back, but it was at cheap rates, a cheap interest rate. Uh, I think it's just called the GI Bill, if I, if I remember it. Yeah. But it, it was a cheaper interest rate, and of course it took, I've forgotten, 15 or 20 years to pay it off, but it was cheap pay, annual payments, and yeah. It worked out, and we finally got it paid out, and all that. Yep. Now you still own that property? No, no. We uh, when uh, we both retired, and I got tired of fooling with cattle and all of that, and so we finally, eight or ten years ago, sold it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. I I know that place. I've been on it. Uh, you leased it to my friend and his dad or the lanes over in yeah, yeah. for a good while. And yeah. so I was helping them work cattle on your place a time or two. Yeah. So that, that's kind of a fun connection. So when you came here, like I knew you as a principal, uh -huh. what did, did you go into administration right away? Were you coaching again first? And how did you, I, I think, uh, I was about my 10th year in the school business before I became a principal. Before that, I'd been the assistant coach and just a teacher in the high school and the ranks. Yeah. And, uh, you remember any good stories from when you were teaching? Like, 
or coaching even like something? Well, I, I can recall one good story here at Comanche. <laughs> And, and I don't think it'd be an inappropriate to mention names. It'd be the Juvenal family. Juvenal Juvenal is a acting president or something at Texas State Bank right now. And uh, the Juvenal dad came from Mexico. Now, Juvenal, their last name's Sierra. Sierra. Right? Yeah. yeah right. Juvenal Sierra. Yeah. 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 Those children came through here, and the dad and mom had come here. But they had a job on one of the dairies. And, yeah, you bet. And the dad, non-English speaking, but he and his mom, the mom was very interested in those boys or children getting an education. And when I was principal at elementary school, Juan was one of the older boys. Juan was, could stir the water a little. <laughs> He's a good yeah. kid, but he just he just wasn't sitting still long and all of that. <laughs> The teacher one year had sent notes home, and the, the old uh, elementary school buildings had wings, we call them, with windows on both sides of the wings. And and uh, one day, a, a young child came in my office and said, hurry over. The teacher says, this man's looking in the windows and things. And I ran over there, and his mistress, Hoovenal, the I mean, Mr. Sierra, yeah. who knows daddy. Yeah. But he was looking in the windows, and he'd been getting notes about Juan not behaving. He's, he's on the school side. He went against the school. <laughs> sure, right. He couldn't speak English, but he is up here, and he's going to look in that window and tell Juan. But uh, to jump forward, Juan gradu- went on. The little boy was sort of a troublemaker. He, he wasn't bad. He just... Mischievous. Mischievous. Yeah, pro- and probably was was having a kind of a crazy life to come from Mexico. Oh, yeah, and, you bet. And have non-English speaking parents and, you bet. and all that. And we have kids going through that today. True. So, true. you know, some of that is, well, they're living kind of some tough stuff anyways, yeah. and, and maybe they're they're yeah. acting out a little bit. Well, Juan went on and graduated from Texas A&M. He really? was a little boy who was a troublemaker anyway, <clears throat> but graduate a good story. Graduated from Texas A and M, and he still has a very I call it a high ranking job, something with the Texas Highway Department on the interstate between Austin and Dallas or something like that. Yeah. And then the younger brother Hoovenal uh, went to A and M, I think, and graduated, and he's been connected with banking around this Comanche area, and now is connected with the. Texas Bank. So that was one of my favorite uh, success stories of schooling and things. Yeah, I think anybody listening can gather a lot of good information from there. I mean, what I hope everybody can hear and learn from the story is a parent loved their kid. Yes. Wanted them to have more and better. Yes. And was up at the school supporting the school and making sure that kid Exactly did right. The best he could. Where we'll find a lot of times these days. Yeah. I sit on the school board. I have for a while. I've got kids in school. We find that a lot of times the parents don't really support the yeah. progress, or the accountability and expectations of their kids to be more. Yeah. And that's just, I think, part of the sad truth of. Our lives being very abundant, yes. <laughs> you, know, you know, somebody that grew up without in the depression times and trying to get to America from Mexico, all that tough, tough stuff. They value these opportunities. Yes. Not they don't <clears throat> discount them as somebody is after my kid or expecting more than required. Yes. Um, I mean, I just thought you're story of your teacher just give you a spanking if you weren't paying attention like hey wake up listen up you don't get to get away with that (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. all right so that's one story from being a principal or and i really appreciate you sharing that one and i hope juvenile see now juvenile's daughter jessly is about my daughter's age Uh so yeah it it all ties together (laughs) jessly's i guess this would be granddad yes yes and you know and and at yeah. that time my granddad or or i guess that would be my granddad my kid's great granddad eltus well he's sitting on the school board probably and yeah tell that story again you mentioned it a little bit before we got to recording about how the current campus 
okay. some of that property got purchased. It's hard for a lot of people to understand. Years ago, that was just a pasture. Oh, yes, yes, farmland. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yes, uh, the old, uh, what I call uh, the three-story building, Comanche High School building, it's no longer there. It, uh, Of course, it, it almost decayed. It's going to fall in. So the school board had to come up with another plan. And that's when uh, the idea came about moving the school out to new ground. And I recall very well at the school board meeting when it came up about buying new land, your dad or granddad, Elsus Dudley, was a holdout. The, the board members were in favor of buying some land out where the high school, present high school is, but they didn't want to buy about whatever, three or four acres. And your dad, granddad held out, no. That land is available. It'll fill up someday. We need to buy more land out there. And he was responsible for buying what they eventually bought in acreage. Uh, I don't know how many acres are out there, 10 or 12 or so. But yeah. the, if it hadn't been for your granddad, I don't know if the – because if, if the school hadn't bought it, it would have built up with houses around there. Right. Yep. And, we're We're in the process of just trying to maximize that property and, and – make our schools safe and all these things that are important to do these days. And yeah. it is kind of fun how I really appreciate being living in a community that I have been in. My family's been in for a long time. It's, it, yeah. I appreciate it. I like hearing these different stories, not that one family or person is ever the sole, you know, nobody ever does anything by theirself, but yeah, it's kind of cool to know we were a part of it. Well, that's true. Very true. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, all right. So you've gone along. Now you're, you've been elementary principal for a while. Yeah. Have we skipped anything super important in there? We've got your childhood. We talked about school, kind of career a little bit into being a principal. No, I don't know of anything really. Uh, it's just that time changes everything and has to be expected. Uh, yeah. Uh, I look at the world and its future nowadays and I, I don't see some good things along the way. <laughs> right. I'd hate to be pessimistic, but uh, I won't be around, so why should I worry about it? <laughs> well, as you've lived these over this amount of time, was there ever a time where you thought, man, we got it all just right. No, I think you brought a good point there. There's always hope. Yeah. Uh, from my early childhood when we were poor, I mean, just flat out poor, not just my family. It was many, many families. Just poor. Uh, you, you didn't have good clothes. You wore the same thing they wore out and everything. <laughs> Nowadays, it's a fashion to have worn out britches, your knees yeah. showing, your legs showing. And back then, you that's all you had to wear. Right. But uh, it's just the changing of times, and we're, time will change everything, an old statement. Yeah, you bet. I think it's good for everybody listening to just remember that. Yeah. There are stuff, there is stuff about our world right now that's scary, and I wish it yeah. was different, yeah. but there was stuff about the world <laughs> In the 30s, that was scary and you wished it was yeah. different. It'll kind of always be there. What we got to do is not quit, not give up, keep uh, keep trying yes. to get better and make a better way for really our kids and yeah. the future generations. I do want to talk to you about uh, faith and, and Christianity and God. Those things yeah. are really something I talk about on this show a lot. Yeah. I'm curious what I know we go to the same church, so I know for sure you go to church. <laughs> what do you think? How did you get like, how did God come into your life? And how do you think about that? I think uh, years ago, my younger days, uh, there were many more little country churches. You might call them country churches. Uh, each community seemed to have a church. It seemed like back in those days. So, because of transportation, they, they couldn't all drive a car into town or somewhere. But in my area, it was be the Zion Hill Baptist Church, Van Dyke Church, and it's still going, by the way. Well, that's cool. I think started at 1912, 10, 12, somewhere back in there. 
I have a picture of my mom and her group being baptized in Duncan Creek there, just south of Zion Hill Church. And uh, and uh, you just had a, a, a an easier, more convenient way to go to church, I think, then. They were dotted around in the county. But I, I worry about Christianity nowadays. Uh, I hate to use the word decline, but I can't keep from thinking maybe it, there's a decline in church nowadays. Uh, the pandemic thing of recent years certainly didn't help anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you just got to have a hopeful Christianity in your life somewhere, but I hate to think it's negative nowadays among a lot of people. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, the, the world is changing, and I'm, I'm afraid that Christianity may not be, have its importance that it used to. Well, I would say it still has the same importance, yeah. but the humans yeah. aren't picking it up and uh, using it and yeah, studying it and living yeah. by the principles. I think that's it. And probably more other things to do nowadays, more mobility. And I don't know. It doesn't seem like there's a sincerity as there was 50 years ago. Right. <clears throat> now I just, this question popped into my head. I'm not even sure why I think you talk about mobility. I was a couple of days ago. I flew from Stephenville, Texas to Amarillo. It took one hour. Uh -huh. I'm wondering when you were coming from Demet to Comanche, <laughs> wonder, wonder how long that took. I mean, what were you traveling in? <laughs> well, I, I don't know how long it took too long, <laughs> but 55 and 60 was a speed limit everywhere nearly. Of course, yeah. the, not all the automobiles would drive 70 or 80 anyway. Yeah, right. In fact, few of them would, but, but it was a long trip, like seven hours or so from uh, the Panhandle, uh, Amarillo, back to Comanche. And uh, uh, the automotive industry is so improved now that it, it, there's no way to compare it to back 40 years ago. Yeah, I think probably even the infrastructure is way better. The roads are probably a lot better. Oh, yeah, so much better. Yeah. You might have been driving on dirt roads for quite yeah. a bit of that trip. Oh, yes. A lot of repairs. Definitely. Yeah. What about what about your family? So you and Elaine, did y'all have any kids? We have two. We have a boy and a girl, Kevin Wilson. Uh, he went to a trade school down at Waco and got into the printing industry. The old-time printing industry, you had linotype machines and flopping press, press machines, and now all that's gone. It's all done by computer and printouts now, but he's in the printing industry and has been all of his life. And, yeah. and my daughter, Camille, uh, she married a young man that uh, entered the Army, and they went to... His assignment was to Germany. There wasn't any wartime events then, but they spent a year, almost two years in Germany. And then she divorced and came back here. And she has worked at the local Western Rest Home, uh, old folks home, for 30 years now. Yeah, I think it takes a pretty good person to be around old folks and needy people like that for 30 years. No, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of her for that. I'm very proud of her. It's a thing I say on here uh, when you're looking for something to give back, somehow, you know, we should all be thinking about how could I give, how could I give? Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's time. Yeah. And time's our most valuable asset, you know, I believe. Like, ultimately, none of us really know how much time we have. So it's immeasurable, the value. You, you don't even know how much there is. So I I try to get people to think about, man, just go visit uh a nursing home or somebody that might not get a lot of visitors that's true you know? and then the so i really think i give my hats off to camille for for working in that industry for 30 years and being that person that really helps somebody towards the end of their life or they're just going through health issues they need a lot of, and it's not easy work i know well, that there's so many patients there that never see anyone hardly uh, it's just employees are the only ones will talk to them sometimes that's right so 
uh, high five Camille and, uh, you know, challenge to everybody. I need to do it more. I don't do it. Me and my daughters, we should go just say hi because you really, you kind of forget also how valuable the human touch is. Just, just the idea that you got to see somebody and they cared about you. That's all super valuable too. How are you doing? Are you need a drink or want to take a break? No, no, I'm fine. I've, I've been blessed with good health for my age. I can't complain. Uh, I'm good for three or four hours a day, and uh, my memory's not so hot, but I keep me a work list going for day, days ahead, things to do. Uh, I don't sit on my high knee all the time. I get out and move around and try to do some activities. Do you think that's been important to keep in your, your mental capacity? I, I, I do. Uh, I, I, I say it gives me a, a reason to live and to do better. And I think activity is important. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, what's some examples of the things you have on your list? I'm thinking I want to model that. Like I, yeah. that's, you're being a mentor to me in that regard outside of what you did as me as a little elementary kid student i remember even always looking up to you and just thinking man mr wilson he's just he's a nice guy he you know i mean yeah. you're not gonna put up with a, a bunch of bull but, but you're also nice i don't know if i could be a principal now i don't know if you can still use a little paddle <laughs> yeah right you didn't want to go in there and and or, or, and receive the consequences you had earned. You know, that's what I think is a good way to think about it. Like, all I did was receive the consequences I had earned. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I, I, I've been uh, lucky. I guess it's lucky. I don't know what the word is. I watch care of the, my master of the Lord. I don't know. But I, I feel very fortunate to reach this age with the health I have. Yeah. <clears throat> So what are some of those things you keep on the list to, to be sure and do? Oh, I go out to some of the old cemeteries just checking things. And uh, there might be some trash or clean up around the fences areas. And uh, and uh, that that takes more time than you think sometimes. Uh, well, yeah, because yeah. nobody else is doing it. That's I true. Mean, yeah. Preston uh, Cox, yeah. he's one of the guys. He's, he is he one. He's Sort of a nobody in a way, and yeah. but he does he does a super job out here. Yeah, yeah. You bet. Well, it's it occurs like that. I want people to hear that. Ninety two year old James Wilson bothers keeping himself responsible and accountable and yeah. trying to do something good. Yeah. Like I love yeah. that. Ever we should all do that. I mean, if it's go to the nursing home and visit people. Go clean up around the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Make sure your own house is in order and those kind of things. It's all valuable. We have a, tra a highway trash area on Highway 36 coming out of Comanche. It always seems to collect trash along the fence road, blowing tr paper sacks and things. I, I try to keep that t cleaned up. and Just a little odds and ends will pop up. I'll see something. Well, I can do that, so I'll stop and do it. <laughs> yeah, it's a great... <clears throat> Uh, lesson. It's just a great thing. I hope people hear. If you see something needs to be done, and you think you can do it, don't leave it for the next person. Go ahead. That's part of the cowboy perspective. That's part of how I was taught by my dad, my granddad, and really the cowboys that my mom, cowboys that raised me. Uh, to like, if you know it needs to be done, and you walk right by it, that that's about the laziest thing a person well can, true yeah, can yeah. Do. true very true you see yeah. it you know it needs to be done <clears throat> yeah very true don't just walk right by it yeah okay so i think we've covered a lot of stuff i really appreciate your time you've been a joy for me in my life and especially over this amount of time we've been talking I'm wondering, would you say a little prayer over this conversation and maybe even this community? Is yeah. that something you'd be comfortable doing? Yes, I will. All right, uh, good deal. All right, thank you for the chance, yeah. Our Father, we're just grateful that you we know your watch care is with us each day and that we give you proper credit. Uh, your love always satisfies us personally, and your mercy always gives us hope. We just pray that we're worthy of the 
the results of the good life you allow us and that we be a productive citizen as we live day by day. And let us not forget that Jesus Christ came to bless us. And we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Anything else before we stop? No, I'll probably think of something later, but yeah, uh, sure. I appreciate your work in the community and uh, feel feel proud of yourself with some things. Yeah, well, I feel kind of responsible. Yeah. One of the things I think God gifted me with is I enjoy this. I yeah. really enjoy talking to members of the community. I like just being honest about life yes. that is kind of messy yeah. it's not easy it's hard some people you know we all have a different journey right yes like if i'm comparing myself to everybody else that's not really a great idea because yeah. somebody's comparing themselves to me and i don't think that's a good idea either because yeah. you can be a lot better than me you never know your top end capabilities if you're mm -hmm. always comparing to somebody else you got to try to just run your own race the best you can yeah. Yes, very true. Yes, yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. Everybody, thank you so much for listening to this part of our series about the history of Comanche. And Mr. Wilson's one of those people who's really been a huge part of this community and the history of this town. I was going to say, now that makes me, rem reminds me, w like when you remember the square or downtown, was there any businesses down there? Or was that? <laughs> Did people come gather in around the square a lot? Uh, if you're thinking back into maybe the 60s, 70s, or some of those those times, what was different about the town? Well, the simple life, I guess. Uh, Saturday, Saturday afternoon was a big day every week. People just said, we're going to town Saturday afternoon, and there wasn't any parking curbs around in the city square. You just parked where you could. So there were different angles of parking, and it was hully gully, you might say. Yeah, sure. And uh, but then people walked the square, walked around the sidewalk, all four square, or four sides, and you'd see someone to talk to. So it was an association, a weekly association meeting, and well, you you, you didn't drive. 50 miles or 100 for entertainment. You just drove to the square in Comanche and spent Saturday afternoon in it. It was a slow-moving, friendly time is what it was. Sure, I bet that and was. Look forward to every Saturday. Yep. Seeing the rest of your friends and people in yeah. town and hearing what was going on in their oh, lives. Yeah. I think we had four barber shops and two barbers in each barber shop and every store was filled up and had maybe two or three grocery stores on the square. You didn't have supermarkets then. <laughs> right. No. A diff wow. different life. Yes, sir. Different life. Fun to think about and fun to think about how you could bring some of those. In my life, I think, how can I slow down a little? Because it was just yeah. super fast. I'm, I seem to be really busy all the time. Yeah. Well, maybe we need to take Saturday afternoons and It'd be nice. Be a square. nice thought. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, everybody. See you next time. Come back. We'll have another conversation with somebody I know can be valuable to you if you give them a chance to listen to their perspective.